myself again But it's the only way you're ever gonna learn your life back And it's all in the past Good evening and welcome to NUFC Matters when we see great. It is Wednesday night, which means it's retro night. And as always, me and the guys will be looking back at games between New York United. And uh, not one team tonight, but two teams, mainly because it's so difficult to find games between Newcastle and Swansea and Newcastle and Cardiff that the lads had been able to remember. But also there's a lack of celebrities and players that played for both. So we've combined the two. It's a bit of a Welsh special. And uh, to kick us off with uh, this tonight, as always, is George Mitchell. Good evening, George. Uh, who are you Hi, going to go Steve. With, mate? Uh, yeah, um, interestingly, the two games I've, I've uh, remembered and I was at and was able to re recall for the night, uh, there was only a month between them, between one with, with Cardiff and one with Swansea. Um, and it, I'm taking you back to 1952 and the first game is the Cardiff game on Christmas Day 1952, the day before my 10th birthday, 11, sorry, 11th birthday. Um, and uh, as always, the, the chicken road academy had been drilling us about what I was going to see when I saw Cardiff. Uh, lots of Welsh nationals, uh, star players and all the rest of it. However, we were playing quite well as well at the time because uh, we just, in April, had just won the FA Cup for the second time on the trot. And also, at this time, uh, in, in uh, First Division, we were doing quite well. Uh, the downer at this, uh, at this particular time was that Jackie Milburn was having injury problems with his, with his cartilage. And indeed, it was shortly after this, uh, he got so frustrated, he made, his, he made his one and only transfer request to Newcastle United. He was so frustrated. Uh, however, the game was, uh, as I say, it was on Christmas Day. Um, and uh, Cardiff had, uh, well, all Welsh internationals, Howells, uh, Sullivan, the full-back, Howells, the goalkeeper, Howells, Sullivan, uh, Northcott, um, in, uh, midfielder, um, Chisholm, a very dangerous attacking midfielder and player, um, a, a winger, uh, all who, who played for Wales and all, all of a high standard. Cardiff were also um, in a good position in the league at this particular time as well. And uh, just to uh, um, add uh, grist to the mill, of course, there were lots of rumours about the, the man Chisholm, Ken Chisholm, who uh, rumours were circulating all over that he was coming to the North East. And uh, as I say, the, the Chicken Road Academy had him, had him in our forward line and were thinking, well, him with uh, Milburn, Robledo and... Uh, Uncle Tom Cobby and all would be unbeatable. Uh, but lo and behold, a few months later, where did he go? He came to North East, all right. But he went to the Mackhams uh, to team up much later on with uh, with Trevor Ford from Swansea. Our team that day was uh, was uh, uh, mostly the uh, cup final team, largely. Simpson, Cowell, uh, Cahill, Stoke, O'Brennan, Casey, uh, Tommy Walker, Billy Fuchs, a Welshman, a very famous Welshman, Vic Keeble, um, Tony Mulgrew and, and Bobby Mitchell. Uh, crowd was 36,143. There was a light covering of snow on the, in, on the ground and, and around. And uh, as usual with the St. James's Park at that time, where the taken <coughs> had to protect the uh, pitch from frost, the straw was piled up around the, the little wall at the side of the, of the, uh, of the pitch. And uh, of course, People like myself who wanted to sit on the little wall found themselves sitting on uh, piles of uh, dirty straw, but it was uh, in some ways more comfortable than the than the concrete wall was. Um, it was uh, one nil at half time, and it, it was an even Stephen game uh, at that point. And uh, after half time, uh, Billy Fuchs took the game by the scruff of his neck and played one of the best games, I'm told. Uh, for me, it was a great game, but um, my, my family said it was one of the best games that Billy Fuchs had had for Newcastle United. He just took Cardiff apart. He scored the second goal, and then just before the end, he was about to get his hat-trick when he was upended by none other than um, Sullivan, the, the Welsh fullback, and uh, Bobby Mitchell slotted home the result of the penalty. Um, 
interesting season. We finished um, eighth that season, um, and the t- top goal scorer for us that season was George Robledo with 39 goals. 39 Jesus. goals in 40, 42 matches. I mean, that takes some going. The other interesting side of that is, of course, because the five seasons before that, five seasons, Mark, yeah, the top goal scorer was none other than Jackie Milburn. So any, people wouldn't know why he was a legend. Well, five years on the trot, his top goal scorer takes some beating. But George Robledo, 39 goals. Jackie Milburn, although he didn't play very many games that year because of his, his cartilage injury, he still scored 20, 20 yard. So we were, we were, you know, popping them in um, and uh, sitting there in the, at this particular time, just be, at Christmas time, were in the top five. It was it was really a possibility that we could do something in the league. Uh, and Cardiff were, were right next beside us. Um, the only person to give us any problems that day was the, the, the what we've talked about already, Chisholm, who was... Uh, very smart lad in, in every sense of the word. Big, strong, uh, clever uh, clever with his feet, even though he was a big lad. And a thunderous shot, there's no doubt about that. And uh, a good header of the ball. Also, um, to us mere mortals, he, his uh, physique and his, his look were more like a film star than a footballer. Um, and of course, that uh, attracted a lot of attention from all over the place. Uh, but as I say, he, he was the only one that caused us any trouble. Uh, and, and lo and behold, a, co- a few months later, he ended up with our, our near neighbours. So that's it, Christmas 1952. Um, and a 3-0 win to Newcastle United before 36,143 fans. And it was uh, certainly a, a game to remember. It was certainly one I remembered um, for, for a number of reasons. But... Uh, the top thing was that uh, Billy Fuchs, uh, from what I was told and what I've read since, uh, really took the game by the scruff of the neck and probably had his best game for Newcastle United. I found the selection of Bill Fuchs in the team interesting because he's a natural right winger, right sided player. Well, so was Tommy Walker, and they played them together on the right side uh, and it changed a lot. But uh, Billy Fuchs seemed to enjoy the freedom more and caused Cardiff a great deal of problem. Uh, maybe that's why, towards the end of the season, he ended up being transferred to Cardiff and became a Cardiff player. So that's my first recollection. Christmas Day, 3-0 win over Cardiff City. Can I just ask about that before you, you finish, George? Um, playing on Christmas Day, when did you have your, your Christmas dinner? It was the match in the morning, I think, didn't it kick off? No, uh, no. No, it was uh, it was uh, it was a three o'clock kickoff. So you had your dinner first. No, <laughs> not a lot. <laughs> they, they want to go. To, they want to go to the pub first, then go to then go to the match. Come home and get me and go to the match, and then have my dinner at tea time on my way home. <laughs> Brilliant stuff, George. As always, a great start. And uh, Neil, over to you, mate. Hi. Um, well, I've gone with two Cardiff games, and actually both from the same season. The promotion season under Houghton. Um, the first game was on the 13th of September. It was a Sunday game down at Cardiff. Now, you know, we're talking about great weekends spoiled by 90 minutes of football. This was just a great weekend. It was just a fabulous weekend. Um, flew down early on the Saturday morning with Jamie Fender uh, down to Bristol. We decided we'd, we'd stay, fly to Bristol, stay in Bristol, and then get the train in on the morning of the game. Um and, and Bristol is a cracking place to go for a beer. Um, made even better by the fact that we'd worked out that Bristol Rovers were playing at home that Saturday afternoon. So we decided to have an afternoon, have a, a morning and early afternoon in and around the, the, the old docks where they've, they've, they've renovated <laughs> things and got loads of pubs and some fantastic brew pubs. And then went along to watch the gas play in the afternoon and stand on a proper old school terrace and have everybody going mental. And I, I think they were playing Oldham, and I think they had the big, the most overweight professional footballer I've ever seen playing for Oldham. I can't remember the lad's name, but he, he was getting some pelters off the crowd, and it was fantastic. Um, and then we ended the evening at a crepe van, of all things, because it's posh down south, don't you know? And you get your crepes in the evening. 
Um, then Sunday morning, training to Cardiff with Jamie to meet some of the lads who were already there. Um, Cardiff was a bit edgy. It was certainly a little bit macy with groups of lads wandering around looking for Geordies. And most of the pubs weren't letting away fans in, and that's where Jamie becomes our ace in the hole. Um, Jamie, having been born into a military family overseas and lived around various places, has quite a neutral accent. So the poor sods getting sent to the bar to order rounds repeatedly, and we could just sit quietly in the corner like Scooby Doo and the gang hiding from everything, while, while there was all sorts of bloody apes wandering around Cardiff looking for bother. Um, it was actually a tough start of the season, and the Cardiff away where it wasn't an easy game. I think they'd scored seven without replying their two previous home games before we came into town, and they were certainly one of the contenders for the league. Um, the game itself started um, solidly, and then after about 20 minutes, Colaccini got what turned out to be the only goal of the game. Uh, corner, that was flat back by the keeper. Colo popped it back out to Ryan Taylor, who then crossed it in, and Colo made it 1-0. Um, and then pretty much we shut them down. Um, my recollection of the game is that really they didn't get much of a chance, and I think both their best chances felt to Michael Chopper, of all people. Um, he fluffed a through ball, and then right in 90 minutes after Alan Smith had been sent off, um, rather unfairly, I thought, I think we had, we had to suffer a ref who was genuinely a bit of a homer or felt the pressure of a home crowd. Um, Smith picked up a second yellow, he, he fluffed the free kick into the wall and that was it, game over. Um, it was a fantastic win. Great weekend out with with, with good mates. And I capped off with a flight back home, sat back, sat next to Ando and Nick Lowe's. So it was, it was one of those things where you, you, you bump into people in the airport, you're like, oh, hello. Um, and, and share a pint and a few stories and a dead leg sitting next to Ando on the flight on the way back home. <laughs> Brilliant, great stuff. Uh, Stu, good to see you, mate. Your first recollection? Well, it's only, what, 43 years after George's first one, so we're getting closer. <laughs> <laughs> if we, it's the, well, the 3 0 win on, in, in the Cup against Swansea on the 20th of January 1995. Now, there's been a few famous hat tricks in the time I've supported Newcastle. You know, you've had the like the Shearers, the Spreers, uh, Mickey Quinn's, Denver Bars, Kevin Nolan's, Andy Carroll's. But this hat trick was by Paul Kitson. And not many people would remember Paul Kitson scoring a hat trick for us. But it's the season I keep referring to as the middle season or second season after being promoted uh, under Keegan. And I still can't believe that we never won a trophy. You know, even a cup, you know, we had the perfect cup side. If you're looking, if you're looking back now, it was the. Perfect Cubs side that, that could destroy anyone on the day. Uh, and this this game, uh, the, the first one uh, Kitson scored, it was a glance and header. But what made the goal, um, if, if anyone can remember, was, as we've discussed previously, the, the greatest player ever to pull on the stripes, Peter Bjernstein. He got the ball and he gave it to Gillespie, who had just signed for us, and then ran to Gillespie's position on the right wing. Gillespie then moved down the wing to they create a space. Bearsley just looked up and it was like, it's hard to explain, but like, a, like a, the way he just chipped it and glided it. Uh, Kitson just had to run onto it and it was precise. The precision was incredible. Uh, and it was a glance and header from Kitson. Don't take it away from him. It was a great finish, but the assist made it. But Bearsley made it look just so normal and natural. And that, that's the type of thing that was he was so underrated for, apart from by us. So that was us 1-0 up and Cardiff, sorry, Swansea looked a bit like defe defeated after that. The second goal came in the second half where Hottinger played a, Mark Hottinger played a 1-2 with, I think it was Rule Fox, the man in the black and white socks. He played a 1-2 with him and then created some space down the right wing and crossed it um, into the box. Now, Kitson's... I would say at this stage, he's, he's getting himself a bit excited because he'd only just come into the team. Uh, and as everyone knows, as a centre forward, you're playing on adrenaline, aren't you? And it's all confidence. So he's run himself into, the, in, into a great position, got in front of the defender, and this time more of a power, power to header into the goal. So it puts us 2-0 up. We're in the cup. Uh, we are on a crest of a wave. It's The game's over as a contest. Then the... The third goal, which made his hat-trick, you know, you start thinking, can he, can he get a hat-trick, can he not? 
Uh, and again, the, the man in the black white socks, Drew Fox, on the left wing this time. He uh, he loves the ball, but the ball was bouncing. It was just the way it was nonchalant, the way he just flicked it over his marker. Uh, and Kitson, it's just one of those games that you have. He, he found himself in acres of space, stretched his leg out, uh, and flicked it past and over the, the keeper for his hat-trick. And I think the smile on his face was only matched by that of Kevin Keegan. Because only two weeks previously, that was when Andy Cole had been sold. And Keegan was standing on the steps saying, you have to trust me, you have to trust me. And then the person he puts in the team to replace him scores a hat-trick on the, on the next home game. You know, So that, that was that. Was that. Unfortunately, we didn't uh, get to the final or even win the cup or anything like that. But that was, that was the first game. Because just when we thought of Swansea or Cardiff, I just thought, right, I'm going to have to pick something different and something probably more modern. And then when I, when I was looking through the games, and you think, well, Paul Kitts and Hatrick, I don't think he would have scored that many in his in his career, uh, but certainly only one for Newcastle. And all three of them were great finishes, and it was thoroughly deserved. So that's why I chose that game. Great stuff, Stu. Uh, Steve, uh, on to you, mate. Right. Well, I'm I'm going to sort of go back in history as well. And, and coincidentally, um, as George talked about going to the talking about a game when I was 11, and uh, Unlike George, I haven't got such a good memory. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give him more of a an idea of, of what what going to a game was like, a sort of match day experience. You know, mentioning so obviously Swansea. Um, my first game was in in 1962, and uh, the the which was against Scunthorpe. And uh, round about that time, I didn't go very often because my dad was working. Although I did go at the beginning of the next season to see a game against Swansea when when Newcastle won six nil. But the, the season I want to talk about specifically was the 64-65 season when we got promoted. And, and, and I'll, I'll come to talking about the, the game against Swansea, which was towards the end of the season. But I thought I'd give it a flavour of what it was like as, as a, for an 11-year-old like me going to the match. Um, I've, I've got, uh, those of you that know me know I, I go in a wheelchair now, but I, I used to go with, I could walk with sticks in those days. So it wasn't, it was possible to go on the, the normal parts of the ground. And, and I used to go with my dad at that time in the, in the Gallagher end. Um, going in through the turnstile in the corner, um, but the, the, the one of the things have you, have you got photos, Steve, that I sent through to you? I have, mate. Yes, yeah. just you, you just one, tell me what you want up. The, the turnstile one first was was um, I had to get to the match early uh, the, to get to the to the wall in front of the the, the ground. Everybody yeah. went in those days, unlike those that have been in the recent years while well, there's been seats. The, the there was a wall right around the ground, and and you, it, there was about, about three foot three foot six wall. And everybody, all the kids wanted to get to the wall. So you all dashed to the boys' gates. Now, that was that, this is not at Newcastle, but that was a, a typical site of the boys' gate. And for me, it wasn't ideal to go in there. And also, that was the price round about those times. Um, the, the, I think it was, if, if George will con- confirm this for me, but I think it was about two and six to get in the leaders' end because it was, yeah. uh, there was a roof on that. And the rest of the ground was, was two shilling with the That's adult right. price being, being uh, four shilling and five shilling. It's interesting that it's a boys' gate. No girls allowed, obviously, in those days. But uh, I'm sure girls did. Well, girls did go, and, and uh, but the, the, it was it was noticeable that the, the gate was called boys. Um, so it was a bit of a scramble. Was it not easier? Uh, sorry, Steve. Was it not easier to call it one third rather than two six? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Now, don't for, ask. For those that don't know what two six means, that's 12, half a crown. Half a crown. Twelve, no, no, no. 12, and, a half, 12 and a half pence in the old And, half pence. and uh, it, it's interesting that Thank I, mean, you. I was looking at the, the sort of the sort of inflation rates and, and that's equivalent to about between two and three pounds now. So when you think you're paying uh, 20, 30 quid to get into a game, um inflation has certainly taken over on football more than more than it has in every, every everyday life. Um, so as I say, it was a bit of a scramble to get in. So I quite often went in, which I'm sure I wasn't the only one that used to sneak in with your dad on the uh, in the main turnstile, and you, you you went through one turnstile, and you actually gave your half a crown to the guy behind. So whenever you saw the official crowd figures of those days, there was always probably quite a few more to add on for those that had had fiddled their way in, and it, it must have gone on all over the place. Um, so we got in at the at the front, and. and as George mentioned earlier on, it's sitting on the straw on the wall. Well, you know, in the games when there wasn't straw, all the kids wanted to sit on the wall and uh, with, with your legs over, which because it was at pitch level, the, 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 you weren't allowed to do that. So you had you had police in those days, not stewards, parading around the pitch, 
Um, and, and quite often you got a tough one in front of you and they were chasing the lads down and threatening them to get kicked out and all sorts of things. So and, and police paraded around, paraded around the pitch on the cinder track right throughout the game even, uh, as well as also St. John's Ambulance offering first aid. And the thing that was the favourite at that time was uh, the peanut sellers selling the peanuts for Tanner a bag. I can't even remember when that stopped, but it was it was very popular to get a little little paper bag of peanuts. Uh, and people leaving it at the back through the through their tanner, which was was two and a half pence in in, uh, in new money, down to the front, and then they trust the people, and they did. They threw the peanuts back at them, and often went all over the place. So you get peanuts splattered everywhere. Um, and the other thing that that uh, you could also buy around the ground was it was a program. And, and I, I remember Steve Hasty, I think it was on the Fab Four the other week. He was he was one of his gripes was that you, you kind of buy a program in the ground these days, which is. I just can't get understand that either. But in those days, a young lad would walk around the pitch and buy a program, and that's the program um, of, of the game that was uh, was Swansea game that we're talking about in the minute, the twenty seventh of March, eighteen sixty five. Again, six pence, two and a half p to get that. So you can either get a bag of nuts or a peanut, or, or get them both for a shilling. Um, the uh, so the, the the game was was getting on to start the game. Um, in those days, the players didn't come out well before um, and, and warm up. They, they tended to come on, it, it, not even together. So you got the away team on, were booed on in about five to three, and followed by Newcastle with obviously the the same sort of uh, fantastic reception that they would get now from a from a big crowd in the game. So that proceeds to the game, and then you get the half time, and and the only. Bear in mind, there's no radios, no transistors or anything in those days. So nobody knew what was going on elsewhere. But the, the only way you could find out the other half-time scores was on the scoreboard. And to get that, you had to have the programme because they had a they had a letter against each game and, and it matched the match in the programme. And the, the scores went on the scoreboard and the Gallagher end. So that was so you either bought a programme to get the scores or you, you looked over somebody's shoulder to see what letter what letter particularly Sunderland was so you can see how well they were how well they were getting beat or not. So um and then again, as, as the game went on, no clock to tell you how long was left. So if you didn't have a watch, you were stuck. Other than a, a thing that happened 10 minutes from the end, which was a flag went in the, in the corner of the Gallagher end. They used to have a flag that came down 10 minutes before the end. George, you might have an idea on what that flag was all about, the history of that. I don't well, know. That, but it, exactly that. It was, it was just a, an indication of how long was to go. That it was, uh, and it was uh, started uh, not long after the war. Yeah. So it was if you wanted to get away early for your bus, that was the clue to get away and uh, or certainly give an idea of how long was left if you were getting beaten. You had to had to slurry the game up. So I'm I'm going to talk about the um the, the game that uh, was on the program, the Swansea game, which was the 27th of March. Um, and the, the player that Steve just shown there was was Willie Penman, who I mentioned a few weeks ago, and we talked about Bolton. Uh, Willie Penman scored one of the go- two goals in that game that won us uh, got us promotion. And in this particular game, he scored a hat trick, and, and I think it was the only hat trick of his of his career. This isn't against this isn't from that game, but again, you can see in the in the distance the the old popular side now the East Stand, um, and then the Leeser's Terrace, which is the houses and Leeser's Terrace, which are are still there today. Um, but it was um, Willie Penman who, uh, in, in his time with Newcastle, played sixty three games, and he he was a what they called an inside forward in those days, and he scored 18 goals in 63, which wasn't a wasn't a bad return. Um, and this game, I cannot I cannot remember the detail of the game other than it was it was a second half hat trick he scored, um, and, and Newcastle won three 0 Twenty nine thousand crowd, not the biggest of that season, but well, you know we we probably averaged probably low thirty thousand, so it was a bit below average on that game. But it was, you know, I think it often depended on who you were playing whether it was going to get a plus 30,000 crowd, but it was 29,000 were in um, and, and uh, we went on to win 3-0. Now, that was a, a stage of the season um, where we were starting to put a, a big run together with, with actually, uh, it was it was one of, I think, seven games at the end of the season where we, um, where we went unbeaten and, and that ultimately got us to get promotion and go up. Um, we had uh, We had lost to, lost to Bury. We always seem to lose to Bury. I don't know what it was. And in, in the three years I, I started to go, we, we always lost to Bury at home, and we lost a, a controversial game in February two three to Bury. Um, game uh, we, we, renowned for having uh, eleven minutes of injury time, and Alan Suddick getting sent off for pulling the shorts down of a the guy in the, uh, in the in the wall when we were about to take a free kick. 
But the the thing that impressed that season was was the the, the sort of stability of the side. We we actually only played with uh, twenty players, no subs in those days, of course. But we only used twenty players throughout the whole season, and and, and uh, it was the the a consistent team that played regularly, which was the the crux of it. So particularly in the in the defence and in, in the halfback line, um, in goal, Gordon Marshall who played every game, Dave Craig and Frank Clark at fullbacks. And and the, the halfback line particularly was with Stan Anderson, Jim Eilley and, and John McGrath. That picture there is the uh, the team that went up to the championship. Um, Jim Eilley in the, the top left hand corner, John McGrath top uh, top right, and Stan Anderson next to Gordon Marshall on the back row. Um, in front of them uh, is uh, Ron McGarry, who ended up the season as the um, as, as the top scorer with only sixteen, surprisingly, and alongside him. To the left was was Dave Hilly, who was the second top scorer with with twelve goals, but we actually scored eighty one goals that season, and and, and that's it as a result of something that was pleased Super Mac from what he was talking about as the goals were spread throughout the team, and thirteen of the players in that twenty man squad scored that season, so it, it was good to spread and and have players throughout the side scoring, um, so um, and, and it was a you know it was a, it was certainly as I say the the the, the stability of that team that that got us. Um, another thing that happened that season, which uh, is never really seen as, as a record, it was the start of Match of the Day, when Match of the Day first started. Um, and Newcastle actually featured in that first season, um, although it was a as a second division game. And we are, we're actually the first second division team to be on. Typically in that season, we, we only lost nine games. And the, typically the BBC to find one of those nine to, to make us on Match of the Day. It was a game against Leighton Orient in, uh, in February. So, um, but that was the season we went up. Um, and uh, obviously we stayed in the in the first division um, initially under Joe Harvey um, until the late seventies when uh, everything started to go wrong. One of the things we've talked about. So that was a great season. And uh, so, well, as I say, we beat Swansea in that season three nil or three one as it happened with uh, that goal from that hat trick from uh, Willie Penman. Great stuff, a great start of the show, and uh, combining these two was definitely uh, the, the right idea. A uh, big shout out to our sponsors, uh, Spider VPN, for all your internet security. Then Google Spider VPN, they come up at the top of the internet search, and uh, they are the boys to trust with helping you protect your computers, your passwords, and whatever's on them. Uh, skipsandbins.com are staying with us for another month as well. Telephone 0800 25 45 25 3. Email inquiries at skipsandbins.com. Website www.skipsandbins.com. Easy contract free and pay as you go waste collection. Also a big shout out to John at qtechshop.co.uk. The makers of pool tables and snooker tables and walls in Newcastle. He's back home now. Uh, got over the worst of COVID, so uh, he's recuperating at home, which is great news. And a uh, big shout out to John at Jab Signature, of course, who makes all of our flyers. Also, two new sponsors this month. It's because the season has kicked off. We've uh, been inundated with their uh, funeral parlours. Darren Baldwin, who sponsored us right back at the very start of NUFC Matters, is back for one month. Yeah. Uh, and he is um, an independent funeral director. Let us look after you in your time of need. Local direct cremations available from £1,495. They are based in Gateshead on 304 Old Durham Road. And you can find them uh, and, and contact them on the website, darrenbaldwinfunerals.co.uk. Email darren at darrenbaldwinfunerals.co.uk or give them a ring on 0191 478 2730. And uh, we also have LG, LNG Family Funeral Directors. Uh, simply give them a ring at 0191 389 7245. Uh, big thank you to them for coming on board for this month. Uh, don't forget, got a couple of interesting podcasts coming up over the next couple of weeks. Uh, one is with Peter McAleese, who was the man who uh, was uh, given the job of finding a group of men who would go and kill Pablo Escobar. Uh, SAS guy, cracking story, uh, and he's got a good book out as well. You might have seen him on TV recently on BBC Two, chatting to uh, uh, chatting through his story. But uh, got him on, and uh, another military man, Jamie Hull, is going to be on the podcast very soon. Life on a Thread is his book. Google that on Amazon. What a story that is. Um, so uh, keep an eye out for those two podcasts uh, coming up very soon. OK, George, back to you for your second recollection of the night. Yes, well, I've, after those adverts, I hope I don't. Uh, this one doesn't die a little bit. That, uh... <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what, Steve? You'll never live that coffin stunt down, will you? 
<laughs> well, it's funny when I did the show with Liam last night, uh, Liam did say that um, I've got the perfect costume. He says I should don the cassock every time I read those out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, the second game I said to you was only a month uh, past the first game. First one was Cardiff, second one was Swansea. Uh, 10th of uh, January and uh, lo and behold, third round of the FA Cup, who do we draw but Swansea? And uh, it was uh, the season when we, we could do the impossible and have three cup wins in a row, three cup finals in a row. And uh, the anticipation was was incredible. Uh, I mean, at, at home in, in, in Chicken Road at, at that particular time, every, every conversation there was something in about the cup and what we're going to do it where who you know who was going to be in the team and all that sort of thing it, the, the, ex, the excitement was palpable in, in around the place and lo and behold it was palpable around the city as well because the crowd was six sixty one thousand thanks Steve you've anticipated now that's the the, the, the program for the for the Saturday game um I think the teams are on on the next one. I think uh, Steve, the next picture I sent is, is that's the te two teams with uh, Jackie Milburn in the team this time, and then the next picture is uh, is the foggy one where the players are walking off the pitch. Eight minutes in, and that's it. That's what we got. Um, you can see you couldn't see the other side of the pitch, uh, and. Uh, the, ir the irony was the crowd was kept in quite a long time because the Newcastle officials were trying to persuade the referee to have a to start it again and see if they could get it to half time. Because if they got it to half time and it was abandoned, they wouldn't have to give our money back. But if it was abandoned after eight minutes, they'd have to give our money back. So, but the, the referee would have none of that, and the players just disappeared after eight minutes. And uh, lo and behold, we 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 did uh, we did get. Uh, New tickets for the for the game on the on the Wednesday the replay on the Wednesday. However, the, the Saturday game, that's the, that's the Wednesday program. Yeah, the uh, with Frank Brennan on the front. The Saturday game didn't end there though because the Swansea team were billeted at the Rex Hotel at Whitley Bay, which was a popular home for some of the visiting teams in this area because it was on on the sea front. And lo and behold, when they got there, the bus driver said he wasn't keen to drive home. He'd been in touch with the AA. And they said that he would have fog for about two thirds of the journey, one way or another. He was better staying where they were. Well, they paid for the weekend, so they decided to stay, and they would do some training on the on the beach and on the Sunday morning. Well, while we're in the hotel, they discovered that a lot of the waiters and staff in in the hotel had a Sunday league team for the Rex Hotel, and on the Sunday morning they were playing New Hartley at Seton Delaville, and uh, so. Uh, after um, getting their breakfast, doing a bit of training, they went with the lads who were playing for the Rex Hotel to New Hartley. And New Hartley suddenly found their crowd uh, bowl set uh, by the whole of the Swansea squad and, and all the officials. And uh, I gather today there's lots of people in New Hartley still have autograph books full of uh, people like Mel Charles and Terry Bedwin and uh, Ivor Altchurch who, who, who actually went to the match with these lads from the, from the Rex Hotel. So it, it didn't end on the Saturday like people thought, um, but I thought it was quite a touch, a nice touch of the Swansea lads to, to juggle along to a local match just to, just to follow up that, that weekend. So the match went on to the Wednesday, and that was uh, the 14th of, uh, of uh, January. And again, 61,500 uh, on the Wednesday, another 500 on the crowd. And... Uh, a game which uh, was really good. It was a, a quite exciting, uh, more than exciting. And that's 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 the program. Yeah, three three pence for the program. Um, uh, well, that's just one more than a, just about a penny in new money. Um, and uh, the uh, um, the team we played was was a, a good one. Um, Simpson, Cowell, Matt, Michael, Stoke, Brennan. Crow, Walker, Mulgrew, Milburn, and Keeble. And uh, the uh, interesting thing is, is that they managed to, to get Jackie Milburn out again on, on the on the Wednesday, having thought that he might not play at all. The Swansea team again littered with Welsh nationals, 
uh, Mel Charles, John Charles uh, brother was right back, but he like John, he could play across the the whole of the back. Uh, quite a talented player, uh, and Kelsey Thomas, uh, Medwin was a, a really speedy right winger, um, Palmer a good uh, midfielder, and of course Ivor Church and Griffiths on the left wing, and they were. Um, uh, as I say, they were a talented team, but Newcastle were really on form and, and uh, uh, took the game to them. And uh, the outstanding player was uh, uh, was our old friend Vic Keeble. They just couldn't touch Vic Keeble in the air. Um, he got the first goal, which was a header from very near the edge of the penalty area. I, I, you don't see these days many goals from headers around the edge of the penalty area, but with Vic Keeble, it was always a possibility. And uh, and indeed, I, I reckon the goal that Jackie Milburn scored at Wembley for, with his head uh, stemmed from that because they were expecting the ball to go to Keeble and everybody thought this myth of Milburn not being able to head the ball. Uh, and and he, Jackie just showed how rubbish it was because they, they dropped the ball just at the edge of the penalty area and, and Jackie headed it in the back of the net. Anyway, um, Keeble scored the first one with the header. He then set up a second one with a, with a knockdown to, to Little Reg Davis, the Welshman, Another Welshman who, who made it two uh, 0 and then to cap it all towards the end of the second half, um, uh, it was one on top. To the end of the second half, they capped the match off. Bobby Mitchell just went down the left, uh, took out three or four defenders, and then really leathered the ball from the edge of the corner of the penalty area and the far corner of the net. And of course, the crowd uh, went mad. And uh, well. Everybody were on my way to Wembley, wasn't it? it, it in the chat at home was fantastic. I mean, we played so well. Um, it was a, it was almost a, a given that we were going to go to Wembley, and it was fantastic. And uh, um, everywhere you went, people were talking about, you know, um, oh, it's a, it's another one, another year like that. It's it's going to be fantastic. And uh, my dad and, and my uncles, my uncle were uh, getting that. The rattles ready, the the corn crakes ready to, to to go to the next match, and uh, well, typical Newcastle United. The fourth round, the drew Rotherham, and they lost two nil <laughs> to a to a second division side that wasn't even a good side, and that was that was the end of the the three uh, consecutive cup uh, wins. Uh, Rotherham put pay to that, um, but the excitement of that of that game was was incredible with 60 over 61,000 people in the ground not only on the saturday but on the wednesday for the replay as well he even added another 500 so a great uh, memory and an exciting memory um for newcastle against swansea town that's great my stuff match. great stuff george thanks as always for supplying the photographs as well always adds a little bit of flair back to the uh, the older games i feel when the, the black and white photographs mitch on to you for your second uh, recollection well, second games the same season that I talked about earlier uh, under Hutton. Uh, um, it was a interestingly a Friday night game. I think this was my first Friday night game ever. For, I can't remember why it was shifted, but it was a Friday night game. Um, and I, the, the, with it being a Friday night game, there was a group where Jamie Fender, who I talked about early Chris Betts, Johnny Melrose, uh, Les Mowbray, Brownie. And uh, even Mr. Hasty, it, it, on occasion, used to go for what were called the regular Friday pint and the strawberry on a Friday evening. Well, this turned into an irregular most of the day in the strawberry. Um, to start with, as well, took time off work to go for a few beers before the game. The novelty of having a game on a Friday night. And that's all fun and games until you step out into a cold February evening and your, your blood alcohol level reminds you that it's there. Um, so a few will manage to get the ground just about in time for kickoff. Um, it was a interesting game because he also, I think, Hutton had made something like six signings in the January window, and he played all of them, which, which was a bold move. But he obviously knew what he was doing uh, because the game turned out to be a rout at the end of the day. I think this was the game where Andy Carroll probably properly made his name because he was an absolute monster all evening. Um, and we got off to a flying start. Three minutes, Carroll. After a corner, scramble in the box, Gary in. Friday night's all right. And then six minutes later, 2-0, uh, own goal, Carroll shot, back off the post and the defender turns it into the back of the net. 
And then 15 minutes, um, 3 0, Carroll's got a thumping header, and we're absolutely all over them. Um, they, they tried very hard to get back into the game, but really, to be honest with you, it was one way traffic for most of the evening. Second half was much of the same 69 minutes. Love and Kranz who come on, a uh, fantastic finish after, after a through ball from Routledge, who was another one who, who'd just been signed and he'd come on and really, really made a name for himself that night. It was, was a fantastic debut. Uh, Love and Kranz got the fifth on 82 minutes, but of course, typical Newcastle United, um, we managed to let them have a consolation just on the last minute. But never mind, 5 1, cracking evening. And then we disperse, and there's a few go home. And Betty said, Oh, I'm going to go and meet my brother in South Shields. Uh, so me and Johnny Melrose head down towards Gotham Town for a, a, a basically to get some cheap trebles in at the end of the evening, as you do. But at the time, I had an apartment in the town centre, and I was told in no uncertain terms I was staying in the apartment that night. So, past stamp, thank you very much. <laughs> um, and. Uh, we we'll go past Clayton Street Chippy and there's Betty trying to navigate the sausage and chips and it looked like somebody trying to dock with the International Space Station. Um, we thought, okay, we better make sure he gets on the metro home all right. So we get him across the central station and on the metro he goes with his sausage and chips in hand. Next morning I get a phone call from Chris Betts. Um, Mate, what was the score last night? This is 5-1, why? Huh. It wasn't 1-0. No, Chris, it wasn't 1-0. It was 5-1, mate. Are you sure? Yes, I'm very, very sure. Oh, okay. Turns out he'd woken up in bed, cuddling a pizza box, he said, which was strange because we left him with some sausage and chips. Um, cuddling a pizza box, totally convinced we'd had a comfortable 1-0 win and everything was all right in the world until he walked past the news agents when he was going to get some... Gonna get, I think he was going to get some orange juice to sort his bad head out. Uh, and saw the, the poster for the journal saying United in 5 1 route. And he, 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 and he, I think he must have felt like he'd slipped into another dimension or something like that. But uh, somewhere between the third and sixth minute, his brain must have just switched off, courtesy of the old day drinking. Um, and it was just one of the most bizarre phone calls I've ever had regarding the game. What was the score last night? Well, we stuffed them 5 1. It was brilliant. And he could only remember the first goal, and that was it. And crack it. But again, Great game, great time with mates. When you've got a group of mates like that, that you kind of go home and away with, and it, 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 you cannot replace it. You cannot replace memories, and you cannot replace a friendship like that. No, definitely not, mates. Definitely not. And uh, that's what this programme is all about. Okay, Stu, what about you, pal? Hey, the picture that you showed there from George with the, the foggy view. That's like sitting with Mitch in the bar when he's got his vape out. You cannot see <laughs> thing when he starts going with it. Uh, but it's it's also very good news to hear that John's back home now. Uh, uh, a nice fella. As yes. well. So it's good to hear that John from QTEX uh, on the road to recovery and get well soon and quick, I mean. Right, the second game I was I'm covering is also Swansea. This was in two where was I? I was living in Lancaster just before I went back to Terry. So it's 2012. And it was around Easter time, and we win 2-0. This is the CCA double with the orange shirts, etc. As I said, I was living in Lancaster, and uh, I've said on the previous, well, not the previous, but earlier in this uh, retro show that we, when we covered Bolton, that I used to go to some of the Bolton games with one of the lads from work. You know, it's like less than an hour's drive down. And because Jacast were there and JC had got his tickets, etc., I convinced him, I'd a proper Rob Leadham, like what Keegan did to Rob Lee, I convinced him Swansea wasn't that far away. Uh, and it's a great night out, which it is. So I, I said, look, I'll, I'll, I'll pay for the petrol if you do the driving and I'll do the drinking. But I convinced him that would have been a good night out, that we should stay in like, a bed and breakfast and so he can have a drink as well. We did it anyway. So he thought we're leaving a bit too early. He did not realise like five hours later we arrived there. And that's from Lancaster, never been from Newcastle. So drop the bags, get the ball, into the game. And if we, if we go back to this season, this is a season that we finished fifth or highest finished for under Mike Ashley's era, isn't it? And if you think of the players we had, like the Chiotis, the Caballas, Ben Orfas, Demba Bars, uh, and the main man for the last half of the season, Papa Sisi, 
you know, it's it's such a shame watching it all. Even thinking that team never mind the Atenas or the the people like say George and Stephen watch. So the first goal was Kabayi with a diagonal through ball, and for those who can recall watching Cisse, he was very cumbersome. He looked, but he was natural with his finishing and everything else. But uh, he either scored a fluky goal or an absolute worldy, and there was there was nothing in between. And in this one, he's he's run onto the pass. Now, to be fair to him, he's created his own space and he anticipated the through ball. And he's about twenty yards out, and he kicks it with his, I think it was his uh, right foot. He was more predominantly left foot, wasn't he? So he's kicked it with his right foot, and it like, like uh, what the, what do we used to call them, daisy cutters? It's just like trundled into the corner, but like with unerring accuracy, and it like bounced over the keeper's hand, and in, in we go. Now, considering he'd scored, I think, two goals, braces, as they were called, uh, and I think the three previous games, it was everything he touched turned to goals for CC at that time. Uh, was it not he scored 13 goals in 12 games or something silly like that? So, we won it up. But uh, if you can recall the, the Swansea team at the time, Rogers was the manager. Uh, it was, he's not my favourite person, to be fair. I don't know why I just have a dislike you know, for Brendan Rogers. But the, the, the team he had at the time were very, very dominant in possession. They would always have the ball. You know, it's a bit like Man City now without the the final uh, finishes. Uh, and they, they took over. But what I really liked about this team, uh, and it was the desire to do better. And what they would do is they would harry the players. You know, they'd rush at them and make them pass the ball quicker. And everyone who's played a game of football, if, if you've got the ball and someone's running at you, you get rid of it quicker. And that forces the error. And I think it's called uh, pressing now, isn't it? They, they call it pressing. We used to call it harrying them and like, just just get at them instead of sitting back in my room. And we started doing this and it, it made them a bit disjointed. But what, what this game is most famous for is uh, CCA's second goal. Again, a, a clip in from, well, another pass from Caballa, same routine. And CCA's controlled the ball and it looked like he's went behind him, and he's dug this out like he's got a sand wedge of a right foot or something, you know, and, and he's he's chipped it like, with probably the most, well, I'll tell you, when he's lobbed it over the keeper, and the lad who went down with this, he says, that is the most audacious chip you'll ever see this season, and, you know, he didn't support Newcastle, and, you know, you had to agree with, with what he said for all but four weeks, because then he scored that absolute belter against Chelsea, Four weeks later, when he loved the keeper, you know. So you think, well, that's that he's just done that. So that was, that was the the second game with with uh, and CC made such a such a difference when he come in, which got me thinking of. And I'd like to ask like George and Steve and Mitch and yourself, Steve. Can you think of a January signing that's made a greater impact to Newcastle? Now, obviously, CC with those goals. Then I thought of Joe Willock, but he wasn't a signing, he was a low sign, a loan signing. Then I thought of Andy Cole uh, with the goals he scored, but we were already up. He didn't make that difference. Uh, he, uh, he, was massive, he was a massive difference. I remember that. Loic Remy right. is always one that stands yeah. in my mind. Yeah. He, didn't have, yeah. he didn't have the same kind of impact, but he, he certainly got goals that kept us up. I mean, that's always the one I think of. And the, yeah. But the way you've described that, I, I'd forgotten about how much of an impact he had, mate. You're right. Kennedy, but the, the one, one player, the only Kennedy. the one player I thought that made the biggest difference from a January signing was Brian Kilclain. Not a goal scorer, but the difference uh, he made why? to the I team was, and was, the position. I was, I was about team. to say killer, yeah. I was Kennedy is uh, no, Kennedy's another one that Steve Wilkinson yeah. just said. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Liam, and yet was a disaster. So be, beware, no Kennedy, no <laughs> Liam Kennedy, <laughs> <laughs> Liam minus <Yeah>. Liam. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I just thought it's like the, the, the difference that CC made from his debut against Villa you know, when he, and he dug that one out and the goals against Chelsea, the two against them, everything, you know, he was unbelievable. And he could have been, you know, with the right application and support, he could have been amazing for us. But he was even in the short space, he, he was even, he just tended to drift offside a lot in, the, in his latter games for us. So that was my second game. Great stuff. Okay, uh, Steve Wilkinson? Right. Well, I'm going to come up more up to date than the first time and, and uh, cover the game in the April 2016, which was uh, when when we had Rafa attempting to uh, keep the 
keep us out of the of the, of the championship. Sadly, as we know, he, he failed and, and probably failed because he, he was brought in too late, which was always a, a warning to the, the higher authorities as don't leave it too late. Because Rafa was only given 10 games, if you might remember. And and this was his first win. Um, he, he'd, he'd been clearly not sure about the team. He was tinkering around with the, the side where, where, where played uh, the, the uh, champions to be Leicester first. So it was always going to be a hard game. Got a, got a draw at home to Sunderland and then had two two away defeats and it was it was clear that the the defense was leaking and you know Rafa obviously keen on, on keeping things tight at the back made made quite a few changes for this game. Uh, Dollar was in goal, <coughs> fullbacks were Anita and Paul Dummett brought in for the first game. Um and then Mbemba and, and Lascelles playing in, with them. He also tightened up the midfield. Chelvy had been playing and actually had been captain of the team under Steve McLaren. Um, he, he was left out and uh, Ms. Sissoko was brought in as, as captain. And he played with Colback and Teoti and Sissoko and Wijnaldum in the midfield, which is you know, quite a, an aggressive, uh, yet still forward-thinking midfield with Wijnaldum in there. And then Sissoko doing his run. And on a front, Cissé. He'd been playing Mitrovic prior to that. And uh, he brought Cissé back in, playing with and- Andros Townsend. So that was a team... Um, you can see it's pretty solid in the, in the back and in, in, in defence with, with still a threat up front with those, uh, with, particularly with CC playing. Um, Bright a tense game. As I say, we'd lost the first four under Rafa and uh, things were very tight at the bottom with, with between us and Sunderland and Norwich as to who was going to go down. Um, and, it, and and this was a, it was a tense game and we eventually went ahead just before half-time with five minutes before half-time from a corner, swung in from the, from the left wing um, and Jamel Lascelles headed it down and it, it sort of bounced in off the Fabianski's foot. So we went in at 1-0 one, one at half-time, but they turned round in the second half and a very tense second half, you, you know, almost like going back to those days of David Kelly, you know, we had the tension coming in as the game drifted on towards the last 10 minutes. Um, Swansea had had a chance to, to pull one back, which was just missed. Um, and then a couple of substitutions made. Uh, he actually brought Mitrovic on. And and uh, Perez on for um, for Wijnaldum and, and Shelby on for Teori towards the end, and then we we, we broke in, and it got a second goal in, in 82 minutes. Uh, another corner came in. Mitrovic challenged the defence. It broke out to uh, to Soko with only only about six or seven yards out of goal, and he and he banged it in. And uh, you could see the relief in the ground that uh, you know we'd, we'd, we'd got that cushion of two nil, and then uh, in the 89th minute. Uh, another another goal laid on by Mitrovic slipped a nice ball into the edge of the penalty inside the penalty area to uh, Townsend who slid it under the keeper as he as he came out. So convincing win three nil, uh, and the first of a of a run of, of six more games in the rest of the season where we didn't lose. But sadly the the other games uh, went against us as as we remember and uh, we ended up uh, ended up going down and, and Rafa just failed to save us. So uh, that's my second game. Um, and uh, you know, it's a shame that Rafa wasn't brought in about uh, three or four weeks earlier, and I think he might have uh, might have saved us that year. And who knows what would have happened if we hadn't got to come back from the championship. Some great stuff, great yeah. stories, great recollections from uh, the Swansea and uh, Cardiff era. As always, we'll finish the show off uh, with uh, some celebrity fans from uh, either Cardiff or Swansea today, and players that played for both. Uh, Swansea, Cardiff, or Newcastle United, and Newcastle United, and then we've also got um, the lads putting together a, a team uh, of combined players. So uh, let's start um, with the celebrity fans. So in no particular order. Oh, that's the lad who was the drummer with the stereo, the stereophonics. Yeah. That's right. He was a good friend of mine. Sadly, no longer with us. Uh, can you get his Sh- name, though? Stuart Cable. Stu Cable, yes. Top, top lad. Great guy. Um, just a, a, a good laugh. And, um, yeah, sadly, sadly missed. Um, he was uh, a big, big football fan. Okay, next up. Rob Brighton. Comedian Rob Brighton. That's him. Oh, um, yeah. Prince Albert, Monaco. It's not it? Prince Albert. Not. Probably, oh, probably is this guy an author? Correct. Roald Dahl. He's Roald an author. Dahl. He's, not a, he's an author. He's not an author. It's Roald Dahl. 
Oh, he's the guy that drives the buses on um, Big Gavin and Stacey. What's his name? Is that the one? He's an actor, yeah. Uh, Stephen Rodri. Correct. The actor from Harry Oof. Potter, of course. Oh, Dave good Coaches. Call, Dave Coaches. <laughs> Steve Riz. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> the rugby. <That's... laughs> the rugby player. Gareth Thomas. Gareth Thomas. Gareth Thomas. Yeah, it's Gareth it's Thomas. Weird. It's weird whenever I hear Gareth Thomas because I always th- I always think of the other Gareth Thomas with a long curly hair. It's the same name, yeah. wasn't it? Was it Gareth Edwards or Gareth Thomas? Always the, always the same to me. Anyway, Jenkins Jones. <laughs> yeah. Any idea? Is that the lad from Is Super Furry Animals? Yeah. That's which is named after the sheep, isn't it? The super fairy animals. That's why they named it the band. Uh, Price is his name, and he's got a really, really uh, strange Guto. first name. Guto Price. Guto. There we go. Guto. 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 And how would you know that, George? How? Are you? That's Catherine, Catherine Zeta, Zeta, Jones. Zeta Jones. Jones. Catherine Zeta Jones. Correct. Rather rest. Uh, the spurious one, this one, by the way. Ten no, years this is true. It, it's the Hoff because his wife was Welsh. So he yeah. actually did uh, say he supported he married. Them. He married a Welsh girl, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And Sailor last, Michael Douglas, it? this isn't a wedding proposal. Neil Kinnock. Yeah. Neil, Neil, Neil Kinnock. Kinnock. <laughs> Neil Kinnock. <Yeah. laughs> that was on the news, wasn't it? I, I remember it being a sketch and not the nine o'clock news as well. Brilliant. Okay, yeah. players, 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 players who played for these Welsh clubs. Here we go. Oh, um, I love Come that on. strip as well. Is that Faraday? Wayne Faraday? It's not. No. No. Is it Pat Hood? It's not. Oh, I've had tricked mm. you with this one. No, I'll have to push oh, you, lads. Sadly, no longer with us. Alan Davies. Oh, yeah. Ah. yeah. Alan Davies. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I've got this him in. One, yeah. this, this one, I'm sure you'll all get. Joe Allen. Joe Allen. Joe Allen, yeah. Joe Allen, of course. Uh, Super Joe, uh, who uh, was a legend at Swansea. Chopra. Chopra. Fellas. Fellas. Craig Bellamy. Uh, it's difficult to find a photograph of this guy, but I found one eventually. Is it Edgar? It's not. Ooh. Relatively. No. Cool, got you on that one no. as well. It is Richie no, Appleby. Ah, uh, uh, Richie Appleby. Richie Appleby, his brother played for Barnsley, didn't he? <laughs> of course, his brother, his brother also played for Newcastle, Matty and Richie, of course. Yeah. Shefki, Gucci. Shefki. Yeah, Gucci. Gucci. That's David Edgar. That is David Edgar, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wayne Routledge. Routledge. Wayne yeah. Routledge, yeah. Routledge. John Joe. John Joe. John Joe. Key. 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 E. No. Fernandez. Fernandez. It's funny, I made the point on the uh, the Holly show last night um, that essentially we signed loads of players from Swansea who were in their prime when they were at Swansea and uh, they've all ended up in Newcastle. Some of them are still playing. Fernandez, Shelby. Uh, so, yes. But that's the end of uh, our celebrity and our players uh, run through. Um, it's time to go through the team. Steve Wilkinson, we'll start with you tonight, mate. What's your, right. uh, your 11? Right, well, shortage of defenders actually, and, uh, and so like that. So, but I'm, I'm, I've got Martin Thomas in goal. Um, I resisted Freddie Woodman because I haven't seen him play yet. So, the jury's out on that one. Um, playing three at the back: Fernandez, David Edgar, and Pat Hurd. 
Um, playing four across the middle, Mickey Burns, Mick Martin, Tommy Craig and Kevin Brock. Um, in the role in front of them, Alan Foggan with Craig Bellamy and, although I never saw him play, Ivor Alchurch up front, who scored a few goals. That's my team and uh, manager, I guess the best fit is John Carver. Great stuff. Okay, Stu. Right, I did put Woodward in goal. Uh, I was going to put Shelby in defence because that's where he stands most of the time when he's meant to be playing in midfield. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, I got Pat Hurd, Fernandez, and then John Carver, who played left back for Cardiff. Then the midfield four had Routledge on one wing, Kevin Brock on the other, with Key and Martin in the middle, Mick Martin. And then up front, Bellamy, Iverall Church, and then Joe Allen. And I'd be killed if I didn't put John Carver as player coach. So. That was coach. Good stuff. Coach, okay, coach. Mitch. Over to you, Mitch. Can I show off? I've done two Go teams. On. He's got two. Uh, he's got two. Go on, one, 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 one for... <laughs> we've, had, we've had a double. We've had a double there. We've had a double team, and now you're going with a, 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 a showing off. Showing off. One for Cardiff and one for Swansea. So the Swansea ones: Woodman and Goal. Back three of Edgar Fernandez and Willie Imry. And then on the right wing, Wayne Routledge. And on the left wing, Reg Davies. And then in midfield, Shelby, Key and Kuchi with Al Church and Joe Allen up front. And the manager is Roy Bentley. And then the Cardiff team is Martin Thomas and Goal. The back three are Des Hamilton, Pat Hurd and Paul, Bol Paul, Paul Borden. <laughs> I know, so I disastrous back three. Um, <laughs> Yeah, where? <laughs> no. he, he does, he does, he's in there. And then a uh, midfield five of Wayne Faraday on the right wing and Sammy Amiobi on the left wing. Uh, centre midfield of Carver, Mick Martin and Kevin Brock and Craig Bellamy and uh, Alan Foggan up front and the manager's Jimmy Schooler. Can, <laughs> can, our, um, can our team now play them every week? I think we're just <laughs> <laughs> We'll make it a draw. <laughs> Sammy, oh. there you go. Sammy on the wing as well. Dear I know, man. Right? Sammy on the wing. I have Sammy scores were on the pitch. Usually, usually we've got a cavalcade of a of a Paul and strikers to to pick from. This time we just had a cavalcade of a Paul and players to pick from. I think you've uh, had too much. I think you've had too much time on your hands picking two teams, mate. You've been made a lot of back. It's okay, research, George. man. It's research. Research, it is. I okay, George. Right, uh, Freddie Woodman in goal, um, Harris Bukic at uh, at uh, two, uh, three is uh, F Fernandez, four uh, John McGuigan, uh, five is uh, Mick Martin, six Kevin Brock, seven Billy Fuchs, eight. Uh, Uh, come on, it. Oh, Joe Allen and uh, put uh, Craig Bellamy alongside him and uh, finished it with uh, number 11 was uh, Wayne Routledge on the, on the wing and the manager was uh, again John Carver for all time's sake. Can Great I just stuff. something else, uh, Steve? You know, the programs you put up. When I was researching them, I came across some of them on eBay. The Swansea one, which was fogged off, thirty pounds today on eBay wow. for that program, and the Cardiff Jeez. one, seventeen quid for the Cardiff one. And I mean, that's it. Yeah, it's over fifty years ago, but even so, that's a lot of money by today by any standards. But the, the Swansea one that was fogged off, thirty quid on eBay today. If you've got a wow. good copy. Fantastic, great stuff. So uh, get yourself on eBay if you fancy buying a piece of history. Uh, there you go. And get rummaging around in the loft. You might find a bit yourself. Lads, as always, great enlightening. I'm sure everybody will thoroughly have enjoyed that. And uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you all again next Wednesday uh, for the show. Oh. I'm back tomorrow night, of course, with uh, Super Mac and Gibbo looking ahead oh. to the final friendly of the preseason against oh. Norwich. Oh. Take care, lads. Night, Bye, everybody. Cheers, bye.
I've been talking to myself again But it's the only way you're ever gonna learn your love better. 